Muslim America. I'm Kent Searle, and I was with Action Against Hunger and Homelessness last fall, or last spring, I'm sorry. We're a new organization on campus. We started in April. Um, this is our first full semester, and it looks like it's going to be a, a good one. And so we've got a couple coming events this weekend. We've got two workshops with Jackie Hirsch, who is uh, a student at uh, American University in Washington, D.C. She's going to do workshops uh, motivation and leadership type things, social change, strategies for, that is. Uh, it's called uh, What You Can Do About the Homeless. It's at 2 o'clock in the gallery of the same building. And the next one's at 6.30, and it's nonspecific. It's uh, called So You Want to Make Your Mark in Society, When Are You Going to Start? And those are free. I encourage all of you to go to at least one of them. Um, we have Michael Stoops tonight. He's the Assistant Director of the National Coalition for the Homeless in D.C. And he works at CCNV, which is the Community for Creative Nonviolence Shelter in D.C. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be in Iowa. I've had to learn how to pronounce uh, Des Moines. I would call it De Des Moines and Illinois. I would call it Illinois. And so I've had to learn some of my language, and it is a pleasure to be here. I was in Moline yesterday, and I had to, when I was working out the logistics, I asked the organizer if Moline had an airport, and she assured me that it did. And I knew that they had running water and cornfields and things like that. But So I believed, it, believed her that the Quad Cities had an airport, and when I got there, the airport is so small that all the airplanes come in to the same gate. So I'm glad that I know that Ames does not have an airport, but at least you can go to Des Moines. For the last uh, 15 years, I'm one of the, the oldies of the homelessness housing movement in this country. I grew up in a Quaker family in Indiana on a farm. And my, the reason I worked with homeless people in 1989 is that the church that I was brought up in taught me to reach out to other people. And I also had a grandfather who was an alcoholic who died almost like Beverly Curtis, who will be speaking uh, later on, who almost died several, several years ago when she was a practicing alcoholic living on the streets and sidewalks of this country. My grandfather froze to death on a riverbank in 1959 in Indiana. And why I like working with homeless people is I, I see my grandfather uh, out there on the street in the eyes and faces of the three million homeless people in this country. I graduated from college. I went to the same college that David Letterman went to. I hope all of you, when you go home tonight, you watch uh, David Letterman. I have a, a BA degree, a Bachelor's of Arts in Social Work from Ball State University. We have wonderful t-shirts that say Ball U in the front. I have, a BA, <laughs> I have a BA in Social Work, and I'd like to say to kind of best Dan Quayle, our Vice President, I, Michael Stoops, had a 3.2 grade point average from Ball State University, much better than the Vice President of the United States. Uh, not, not being satisfied with tr traditional courses, I was telling Kent that the best courses I took in college was the history of social work because I learned for the first time that there were pioneers in, a, in, in this movement. Jane Addams of the neighborhood settlement movement of Hall House in Chicago and Dorothy Day of the, the late Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement. So I learned about those folks and I also did it, took a course in world religions, which is very important to me. Uh, leaving, everybody likes to leave the Midwest. All good radicals go to the West Coast and East Coast. And I hated Indiana. Uh, there's a song, uh, I can't go back home to Indiana or something like that. And I left Indiana and I went to Minnesota in the early 1970s. And I spent four years as a VISTA volunteer working the domestic Peace Corps, working with Indians and migrants in, in northern Minnesota. And that was the first time that I was able to work with poor people and live among the poor and be poor myself. I'm proud to say I've never paid federal taxes in my entire adult life because 50% of every federal tax dollar goes directly to the military. In 1988, the Pentagon was sucking up $44 for every dollar being spent on housing. I moved out to Oregon where I happened to meet my, Beverly, my friend Beverly Curtis on the streets of Portland, Oregon in 1976 and I took a job working with homeless people and I fell in love with the neighborhood and the Skid Road environment and for 10 years I lived in a Skid Road community in Portland, Oregon. 
In the early 1970s, the only people that I saw in the streets were people like my grandfather, the stereotypical face of homeless people, the, the middle-aged or aged white male skid road alcoholic who lived on top of a grate or pushed a shopping cart down a main street or in small town Iowa was your local town drunk. Those were the typical people who were homeless in the mid-1970s. I was chagrined to see in the late 1970s that the faces of the homeless were beginning to change. I knew society would allow men to wind up on the streets, but beginning even before Ronald Reagan, who was, really, who was like the modern day Robin Hood in reverse, who stole from the poor and gave to the rich, women began to wind up on the streets in the late 1970s. Families began to wind up on the streets. Children began to wind up on the streets. And in 1989 today, we have an estimated three to, more, three to four million people in America who are homeless. And the numbers continue to rise. Right now, there are 14 million people who are on the brink of winding up homeless in America. And those people are families for the most part. By the year 2003, there's a study that was put out by MIT, which when I'm in conservative places like, like Ames, Iowa, I call it the, Ma the Mississippi Institute of Technology, but we all know it stands for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It says by the year 2003, there will be 19 million people homeless in this country. So what do we do with the growing numbers? We know who are, in, who are on the front lines of this movement. We know that the primary reason why people are homeless is the loss of, loss of affordable housing. During the Reagan-Bush administration, federal housing programs were cut by 70, 75%, 75%. The government has got out of the low-income housing movement. Kent and I will be talking about the upcoming march that we're going to do in Washington, D.C. on October 7th, and we are going to attempt to change the priorities of this country by bringing a million people to Washington, D.C. on October the 7th to push for more affordable housing. I'd like to share uh, my podium time and then we'll, we will answer some questions. Uh, many times homeless advocates like to be the ones speaking in behalf of the poor. And I think sometimes we need to get out of the way and let homeless people speak for themselves. I was given this lecture one time and someone in the back room is at a rotary group and the guy had a hearing problem and he thought I was talking about the needs of homely people and the federal funding for homely people. There are no homely people at Iowa State University, so I want to make that really, really clear. Our next speaker, Beverly Curtis, uh, she's old enough to be my mother or grandmother. She's my most, other than my real mother, is my most favorite person here on, here on this earth. Beverly Ma Curtis, her nickname is Ma Curtis. Beverly is 67 years of age. Beverly has led a fairly sordid life. At age seven, Beverly was given away by her mother and we always, in this line of work, we always wonder why someone becomes homeless. And imagine if any of you were given away by your mother or father and you became an orphan at a very early age. And that was one of the primary reasons why Beverly led, had led the life that she has. By age nine, Beverly was, was drinking alcohol, which is very common among today's children. By the age 12, she's a practicing alcoholic. During a teenager, teen years, her tween years, she was in a reform school, so she's a bad, bad girl. As an adult, Beverly was in prison for 12 years, so we have a real live ex-con uh, who's going to be coming to, coming to you tonight. Beverly uh, was in prison. When she got out of prison, she was a woman hobo. Her nickname was Boxcar Bev, and she hopped freight trains. And I, Last month, I attended the National Hobo Convention for the first time up in Britt, Iowa, and I would encourage any, anyone here to join me next year at the National Hobo Convention. Beverly was a hobo during the 1950s. And what's unique about Beverly is that from 1961 until 1985, this woman lived the life of a homeless person, a bag lady with her shopping cart as a practicing alcoholic in Portland, Oregon. Imagine if you would for a moment if you were homeless last night and you had to go to work and school and do the things that we normally do. And so Beverly was out there for almost 24, 25 years on the streets of Portland. Beverly uh, came to our shelter about 10 years ago, and we worked with her. And, and for the last four years, this so-called practicing alcoholic has been sober, her longest period of sobriety since age nine. I think she deserves a round of applause for being sober.
Beverly's a tough old broad. She has more tattoos on her than Cher, if you've ever seen some of the tattoos that Cher has. And, and uh, <laughs> she always gets mad at me when I say that. And she promises not to show her tattoos tonight. But Beverly's a, she's a unique person. She's the best uh, homeless speaker in America. She will be joining Jesse Jackson on October 7th, speaking to the million people who come to Washington, D.C. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Beverly Ma Curtis. Are we having fun yet? Good. Doesn't he say terrible things about me? He usually tells the guys that I can whip any guy in the house. I'm sure glad he didn't. Boy, there's a big dude. <laughs> Maybe when I was younger and hopping freights, but not anymore. I have to sit back and kind of take it anymore. But you can believe in my heyday, I didn't. I didn't take any crap off any man. I still don't. I don't have to. What Mike said about me being given away by my mother is entirely true. She gave me away when I was seven years old in Redding, California. She kept my brother. Bill is 14 months older than I am. And I couldn't understand why I had to be the one to be given away. Because honestly, I wasn't a bad kid. I became a bad kid later. But I think the worst thing that I had done up to that point in time was hide the gravy skillet. My mother would make cream gravy in this cast iron skillet, and God, I hated to wash that dude, and I would hide it. And I remember I hid it in the outhouse once, and I think she found it the hard way, because boy, she sure whipped me that time. I really got it. When they took me into court, they made me a ward of the court. So they thought, rather than put me in a foster home, they would send me to this Catholic home for children. Now, my mother and stepfather were Christian scientists. This was all I knew. And imagine going into Catholicism. The morning after I got there, boom, into Mass. It's all in Latin. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I didn't understand anything. I didn't know why they were ringing the bell under that guy's shirt tail. It looked so silly to me. They were going in this little room telling secrets, and them they wouldn't let me go in and tell mine. That made me mad. All the kids got to go up and eat, and I didn't get to go eat, and that made me mad. So I became very belligerent. God, I was hateful. I hated the world and everybody in it, and I hated God. And above all, how I hated my mother for what she had done to me. I used to try to kick the nuns in the shin. And it's hard to get to them shins when they're wearing them long habits. <laughs> um, I used to get Father Bennett now and then. Father Patrick J. Bennett. He was Irish as Patty's pig. What a brogue that man had. But he'd shake his finger at me and make me mad and I'd kick the shins. And finally... And I was very proficient at kneeling on a broomstick, believe me. I was there all the time. Finally, they realized that they weren't going to be able to do anything with me because I was so terribly defiant. So back to court, they took me all the way from Sacramento, clear back up to Reading, to run me through court, and decided foster home. It would be they could take care of me. They would make me behave. Oh, yeah. They kept moving me because I wouldn't do what they told me. They threatened to whip me, and they would. They'd whip us kids in those days so they drew blood or we quit crying, whichever came first. All they cared about was getting that county check because, let's face it, in the la last of the 20s and the early 30s, money was pretty darn short. I was constantly getting whipped, but I had a very cruel stepfather that used to whip me, he'd come by me and raise his hand like that and I'd duck. He'd come back and whip me unmercifully and say he didn't want to disappoint me. I didn't have to do anything bad. I just got whipped. By the way, he was from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I don't even want to go there. But 
As I say, I was so very bitter and hateful, so they kept moving me from foster home to foster home. Each one got tougher and rougher, and I got meaner and uglier. I got hardened. I built this wall around myself I didn't want out, and I wouldn't let anyone in. Finally, they put me in a foster home where the people were absolutely the opposite. They were fantastic. They grinned all the time, always laughing, cutting up. The boys didn't have to chop wood and kindling. The girls didn't have to do dishes. They didn't care if we made our beds. If we skipped school, that's okay, honey, go tomorrow. So I finally figured this out, too. It was that bootleg hooch they were drinking. So I decided I wanted to be happy like they were. So I would get up during the night after they went to bed and drink all the drinks they left in their glasses. And I get a pretty good little buzz on. I didn't care if anybody loved me or not. I was okay. But then after a while, it wasn't enough. I was building up this tolerance. I wasn't getting the buzz. So I started pouring it out of their flasks and adding water. Now I'm happy and they aren't. I was watering down their hooch. But I was doing okay. They finally caught me and they moved me again. And I remember these people were very, very strict. But by now, I'm 12 years old and I am a practicing alcoholic. I get up in the morning so violently ill at my stomach, shaking so badly I thought I would fall apart if I didn't get a couple of drinks of that rot gut stuff to stay down. I was in bad shape, even at that age. But I found where the bootlegger was, where he had his stash. So I just cut out the middleman entirely, and I loosened an old one by 12 on that old born, uh, barn, and got it down to one nail where I could slide it to one side, and I'd get in there and get me four or five flasks, is what we called them. They were a curved flask that fit the hip with a cork in them. And who said, yeah? <laughs> that was cute, yeah. No bigger than a minute. And uh, anyway, I would have bottles behind the old outhouse. I'd have bottles on the, in the bushes on the way to school and some under the old two-room schoolhouse. Where any place I started to come down off this stuff, I could get a couple of belts and get back in the schoolhouse and finish my schoolwork. I got caught. I don't remember if I was putting in full ones or taking the empties out from under the schoolhouse. But old lady Fowler caught me anyway and back to court for Beverly. And they decided to send me to reform school. So they did. I went to Ventura State School for Girls where I made my own hooch. I knew how to make pruno. So I still didn't stay sober. And some of the girls wanted to learn how to make it and I taught them. But when those little heifers got caught, they told on me. And guess what? They kicked me out of reform school. They had the unmitigated goal to say I was a bad influence. In reform school? Everybody was a bad influence. But my probation officer got me out of there. So I started, by now liquor was legal, and I started stealing it out of the stores. And any of you that have been in California know that any place that has a storefront can sell booze. You buy it in the grocery stores, the drug stores, any place. Or they have off-sale liquor in some of the bars. So it was very easy for me to go into a grocery store or a drug store and steal a bottle. One day a guy saw me steal a bottle and he told me that if I would do what he told me to do, I'd have all the money that I needed. I could buy my booze or have someone buy it for me. I was certainly underage. And I would never have to go to jail for stealing. And that sounded all right to me. And he taught me to drive a car. And I never should have learned. I started transporting hot cars for the syndicate. Now, he was right about the money because I was making $3,200 a week, which wasn't too shabby. But believe me, I wouldn't advise it because that old law of averages caught up with me. And I got busted and I went to jail 
and they charged me with 23 counts of Grand Theft Auto, which, thank God, that's all they caught me with. If they'd have caught me with all of them, they'd have jacked up the joint and let it down on me. I'd have never got out of there. So I made a deal with the district attorney. I would plead guilty to three counts. They would drop 20 counts. And boy, this sounded good to me. But they asked me where the garage was. Who's painting cars? Who's filing numbers? Who's doing your phony ID for the cars you are driving? And I said, Your Honor, I've been in jail 111 days and I forgot. He said, all right, here's three one to fives consecutive. Let's see what you can remember. This meant I had to do five years, then I could do the next five years. On the third five years, I was eligible for parole. So I stayed there 11 years, seven months, and six days. Because you can believe I was more afraid of the syndicate than I was the state of California. So I kept my mouth shut and I did my time and got an education. They have a fantastic school system in California in the state prisons. I graduated from the eighth grade, then I went ahead and graduated from high school and I got two years of college while I was there. I studied art appreciation, I studied music appreciation, I studied color dynamics, color psychology, color and design. I did ceramics. Uh, in my art appreciation, I, I did oils, I did watercolors, pastels, charcoals, you name it. I learned to do them. I learned to knit, crochet, tat. I studied journalism, was editor of the paper. Anything they had to offer, I studied it because I wanted to stay busy. So when I wasn't making my own hooch and drinking, I studied. And I never did get caught drinking. I think if I had quit drinking, they'd have noticed the personality change and I'd have got busted. Because I'd have been my ornery, mean old self again. But I stayed on this even keel, and I was even an honor girl, believe it or not. When time came for my release, you know, I, I always, when I read in the paper, these politicians want more money. God, it makes me mad. I did inside work for the state of California for almost 12 years, and I made $40. What do they all learn about? They gave me $40, a please don't rain suitcase, and a pair of patent leather shoes, and they cut me loose. By please don't rain suitcase, I mean it was a cardboard jobber painted black. It was something else. I took my $40. They got me a job as a legal secretary, and I was very well qualified. My God, how I had studied. I didn't want to be a lush and a drunk the rest of my life. And above all, I did not want to go back to prison. They told me they were keeping my jacket on open file because I'd be back. And I made up my mind I wasn't going back. I was free. I was not on paper. I had no tail. I'm free. So I took my $40 and thought, well, I'll go have a few drinks tonight. I'll sober up Sunday, and I'll go to work Monday. Well, with an alcoholic, it does not work that way. One drink is too many, and a thousand isn't enough. So I went into the bar, and I ordered a shot of whiskey, water back, and hold the ice. And I never should have done it. Because for the next almost eight years, I stayed falling down blind drunk. When I left prison, I was typing 81 words a minute. Now I can't find the right keys on a typewriter. I couldn't take dictation. No way I could transcribe if I did take dictation. I can't remember the legal terms except what the judge said to me in the courtroom. Because by now, I'm on cheap wine. It's the only thing I could hold down because I had torn my guts up with the hard stuff. So I got me, I couldn't hold down a job. No way I could get a job, even washing dishes. I either had a hangover or I was drunk and I'd break the dishes or I wouldn't get them clean or I was too slow. So I got me a bedroll, a jug of water and a jug of wine and I started hopping freights. And boy, if you think that isn't dangerous, it's bad enough for a man, but a woman alone 
Hey, howdy. They think you are for their privilege. And no way, baby, I don't play that. There are three things you don't do to me. You do not take my jug. You don't hit me if I don't have it coming. And you don't molest me. Not necessarily in that order either. I'd come up fighting. I carried a switchblade knife, which I'm sorry to say I had to use on occasion. I could whip that baby out and drop it down to about that much of the tip sticking out and just in the leg and rip up. And hey, nobody likes the sight of blood, especially if it's your own. And they would back off. I have not killed anyone or maimed anyone for life. Thank God it didn't come to that. But there's some dudes out there packing some scars. They'll remember old Boxcar Bev. They used to say, Boxcar Bev's headed this way and you better leave her alone. She'll cut you a new butt. And I would. I'll mess with them, guys. Take no crap off them. But you've got to be hard. You've got to be tough. You've got to fight. If once they think they've got you buffaloed, they run all over you. And you can't allow it to happen. It's survival of the fittest out there. It's dog eat dog. And you can believe it's no picnic. It's hard, oh my God, it's hard out there on those streets. And it's so lonely. You don't know what lonely is until you've had to live on the streets. I got tired of being a world traveler, so I thought I'd start getting married. Let him buy my booze. That way I wouldn't get caught stealing anymore. I can't count my first husband. I never have, never will. I want him in a crap game in Nevada. Um, my girlfriend and I were hitchhiking through a little town called Yarrington, Nevada. And it was cold and we couldn't catch a ride, so we went in the old L&L bar. God, I'll never forget the name of it. And we were sitting in there having a drink, trying to get warm. That was our excuse. We just wanted a drink. And this hunk came in the door, and I'll tell you, he was pretty as a blue ribbon hog. And I said, mine. And she said, no, baby, he's mine. And I tell you what, let's each take a few bucks, go over here to the craft table, and whoever has the most money in 30 minutes gets him. And I won. So I went over to this total stranger, and I tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, hey, baby, you got to marry me. I just won you in a crap game. He said, let's go to the courthouse and get it over with and come back and have a drink. And we got married. <laughs> we stayed in that bar for two weeks. We didn't come out of there. <laughs> We'd sit in the booth, nod on each other's shoulders. One of us would wake up, wake the other one up and go get free salami and popcorn and crackers off the bar and have another drink. We did this until his money ran out and I didn't need him anymore. So I went down to the courthouse, same judge, and had it annulled. And that's when I found out that my last name was Pennington. I didn't know what my last name was for two weeks. I didn't much care. I was calling him honey and sweetie, daddy. He had money. He was buying my drinks. I married four other men in my lifetime. God, I married some beautiful guys, sweetest guys in the world, and how they tried to get me to put that bottle down. But it had become the most important thing in my life. They all divorced me, but I hold absolutely no animosity toward these men. They were beautiful, they were great. No man wants to work eight hours a day and come home to a drunken slob lying in bed in her own feces and urine, working on about the ninth fifth of wine that day and empty bottles all over the bedroom floor, too drunk to get up and use the bathroom. Of course they divorced me. I was a slob beyond repair. When Stan divorced me, I couldn't handle it. He's my big love in my life, still is. There'll never be another one like him. So I thought, well, if I kill myself, I'll never hurt anyone again, and I won't have to be like I am. It'll all be over. 
So I got a bottle of liquid ant poison and I put it in a cup of coffee and I drank it and I sat down on the edge of the bed and I waited to die and I couldn't even do that right. All I did was burn my throat severely and my stomach and I tossed groceries for a week or so. I couldn't even keep water down. I had a nosy old neighbor, the old biddy called the police, told him what I did. So they hauled me away to the psycho ward with the rest of the nuts. And you know, psychiatrists, they can ask some awful silly questions. How do you spell poison? What did I care? I just took it. Who needs to spell it? Were you in love with your father? Have you ever slept with your brother? Oh, they're sickening. I didn't want to hear all this. Do you ever hear voices and don't see people? I said, yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> and just when does this occur? I said, every time I answer the telephone or turn on a radio. <laughs> and believe it or not, he went down to the office and signed my release. He said that if I could talk like that, I couldn't be too crazy if I could figure that out. And he let me go. But what he didn't know was, in prison, every six months, whether we needed to or not, we had to see the state psychiatrist. And we used to sit around in a group and dream up what we could say to him the next time he showed up to squirrel him up. And that was one of the things we had used in there. It was not original, but it worked. It got me out of there. My drinking got worse because I started having blackouts. And it's horrible. You wake up. Back in those days, they arrested you for common drunk. They don't anymore. But you wake up in the morning in the drunk tank, and you got this property slip in your hand, and you're scared to death to look at it because you don't remember where you've been, what you've done, who you've hit, or who you cut, what damage you have done. And God knows I didn't want another felony. I was going to prove him wrong. I wasn't going back to Corona. No way I was going back to the state prison. And finally you get the nerve and you, oh boy, are you giving it this? And you look at, oh, thank God. It's only drunk and I only tore up two bars last night. That meant I could get a kick out. But it's terrible. Walk down the street, see someone you know. Oh, hi, baby. God, I haven't seen you in two years. What do you mean? I bought you a drink last night. Oh, I don't remember. Because you're in a complete blackout. I went to Richmond, California to see my father, my own father. And we had a few drinks in the tip-top bar. And he went home to my stepmother. I stayed in the bar, naturally. And I met a truck driver. We got to drinking. I remember that, him sitting there buying my drinks. I wake up in the next morning, and I look up at the ceiling. I look over here, and here's the truck driver. I said, what? First thing I said was, have we got a drink? He said, yeah, your side to bed. Here was old Dr. Sunnybrook sitting down there. I got a couple of belts. And I said, what hotel is this? And he said, Wabash. I said, there's no Wabash Hotel in Richmond. He said, Richmond, honey, we're in Chicago. I had gotten that truck and made the complete run with him from Richmond, California to Chicago, Illinois, and don't remember a mile of that trip because I was in a complete alcoholic blackout. This is scary. It's scary when you can't remember I know what it is to go back and throw your hat in and have it thrown back out at you because I was always creating a disturbance. This bitterness and this hatred I had for my mother, I always wanted to hurt before I got hurt. Strike out before somebody could hurt me. I carried that all my life. I thought if I changed towns, maybe things would change. So in 1961, I'd had a good week panhandling in San Francisco. I went down to the Greyhound bus depot and there's a bus sitting there that said Portland. Now why not? So I went in and bought a ticket. I went across the street 
got eight or nine jugs of cheap wine, and I drank my way to Portland, Oregon. That bus pulled in, my teeth were itching, and my mouth tasted like the bottom of a birdcage, and I needed a drink. So I went out and I got in a cab and told him to take me someplace where they were having fun where I could get a drink. And get glow to be old, guess where he took me? Skid Row. Took me right down on 3rd and Burnside. Us street people, we call it Wineside, because that's where we did all our drinking. So I went in, and I got well, and I felt so good I got drunk again, naturally. There was a walk-up hotel across the street, and I wound up there that night, one of your better hotels. Dollar seventy-five a night, fight with the roaches to see who's going to get the bed, no running water in the rooms. You didn't even have a wastebasket if you had to toss groceries. It was a bed, and that was it, Jack. I came downstairs the next morning, and the owner of the hotel was standing there by the desk on the second floor. He said, are you Beverly? I said, whatever it is, I didn't do it. My old guilty conscience, and I couldn't remember. He said, how'd you like to go to work for me and manage this hotel? I said, what? Are you out of your mind? He said, no, I want you to go to work for me. He said, I noticed where you signed the day sheet. I can read your writing. It's very legend. I need someone to work my desk that can write so I can read it. Why don't you go to work for me? And I said, well, let me think about it. I'll come back later. He reached in his pocket, and he gave me a $10 bill. He said, you get over there to Gus's and get well and come back here and go to work. He could see I had a hangover, and I needed a drink. Well, I worked for Maury for several months, but he'd pay me every two weeks. And an alcoholic can't stand prosperity. You give them a couple bucks, they're going to head for Judd if they are an alcoholic. I'd go over to Gus's and blow my check, chin myself in the gutter. Maury would come out and get me again, clean me up and put me back to work. Because when I wasn't drinking, I did do a good job for Maury. And then finally one day, he got tired of my horse pucky and he fired me. And you can believe getting fired on Skid Road is not conducive to getting your next job. You don't get very good references. So now I can't go to work. Words out, don't hire that lush. She's not dependable. In the winter of 1961, I got my shopping cart, I put my worldly possessions in it, and I hit the streets of Portland, and I stayed there till 1985. And you can believe it is hell out there. What an existence. You don't live on the streets, you exist. I've had people walk past me and spit on me. I've had them call me everything but a white woman in a tree. I have been whipped like a red-headed stepchild because I was lying in the doorway and come by and kick me because I wasn't clean and because I was drunk and because I had on seven or eight layers of clothes. It's cold in the Northwest in the wintertime. You've got to be out there. You've got to survive. I've eaten out of the garbage cans and the dumpsters because I was too filthy to get into the missions or any place else that served food. I usually had feces and urine in my pants. My hair was long and matted. I had lice most of the time. But I always had that Mickey of wine. I'd had the DTs and the convulsions. I was scared to death I would die if I didn't get that next drink. It's horrible out there. And oh my God, the loneliness. I'd see a lady coming down the street, every hair in place, her makeup perfection, her clothes so neat, and I'd think, oh my God, why can't I be like that? As I was panhandling, to get my next jug so I could get back down under the bridge and hide and drink it. One day somebody suggested I go to Bologna Joe's and I wasn't going to go. That's the name of our shelter in Portland. It's called Bologna Joe's Junction. And I didn't want to go 
because I didn't want an ear banging. And ear banging to us is when you go to some of these missions and the shame and the degradation that you feel anyway because you're in the shape that you are in, you feel so bad and you can't seem to help yourself or do anything about it. Nobody seems to give a damn and want to help you. But you have to go in there or starve to death. And they stand up there and they point at you and tell you you're going to hell. They tell you God don't love you. They'll tell you that the good Lord don't want you. And they will keep this up for one solid hour before you're allowed your beans and your bread. And no thank you, I won't accept it. Never will I accept that. When I was under the bridge in my sleeping bag, too drunk to ever defend myself, I was never seriously hurt, never molested. Who loved me and watched over me? When I was catching freights on the fly, never knowing who was in that boxcar ahead of me at either end, and was never hurt, never molested or raped, who watched over me and loved me? You bet God loves this old lady. I'm alive and well, thank you. He watched me for years when I couldn't take care of myself, and I won't accept what they say. You bet God loves me. When they told me there wasn't an ear banging at Baloney Joe's, I went over, and thank God, oh, thank God I did. I was about as filthy as I have ever been in my life, and about as drunk, when I got across the river. I had to go to the east end of the Burnside Bridge, and right there sits our shelter. And it was raining, and I didn't know whether I wanted to go in or not. I was so ashamed. I didn't know what was on the other side of that door. I didn't know whether I could handle it, or if they could handle me and my filth. And the door opened, and a little guy about that high, his name was Bob Johnson. He was our kitchen coordinator at that time. And Bob stepped out the door, and he saw me standing there, with my bedroll hung on my back and my water jug in my hand. He said, honey, you look like you need help. He put both arms around me and my filth. He looked past the filth. He looked past the filthy clothes and the loads and layers of clothes, and he saw a human being, a human being asking for help. And he took me inside. First thing he did was hand me a hot cup of coffee, let me relax a little bit. And then he, I guess he saw the lights in my hair. And he said, honey, you want to go see the doctor and then take a shower and go to the clothing room, get some clothes and take a shower? I said, my God, I would love to. So they got me all cleaned up and I was allowed to volunteer in the kitchen. But I have had a double bypass and I now have lupus, so I get SSI checks. I live on $368 a month, but then it was 200 and something. We've had raises since. So needless to say, an alcoholic, I get that check, I get my sack or all my wine, I get some tailor-made cigarettes, tobacco for the boys, let them roll their own. And I'd head for a boxcar down under the Burnside Bridge, and somebody would see me. Hey, Moss, throwing a party in the boxcar. Every wino, dino, and dingbat on the east end of the bridge would show up. They'd all be there. Hi, Ma. Hey, Ma. What I didn't spend, they'd steal, and in two days I'd be back at Baloney Joe's, cleaning up and volunteering again. Michael Stoops was with us at that point in time. And he used to say, Beverly, let me have your check. I'll pay your rent, give you a little bit each day. You can eat here at Bologna Joe's, and we'll get you off the streets. You reach for my check, Buster, and I'll break your arm. That's my check. So I drank for three more years. I drank. And then in 1985, December the 5th, I was sitting out in front of Baloney Joe's on the pavement in the rain with my fifth white port wine, and Michael stepped out of the building 
And he said, Beverly, you know you can't drink like that in front of this building. I said, oh no, <laughs> watch me. And I took the cap off that bottle of wine and I tipped it up and I killed it right under that beautiful man's nose. My best friend, the one person in this life that could see something in me I couldn't see and wanted me to do better. How I insulted him, how I hurt that man. And I could see it on his face as he got in the van and drove away. And I put that bottle down and I started talking to myself, hey self, that's the last person you're going to hurt through drinking. You never hurt anyone intentionally again through cheap wine. And I left the bottle right there on the street. I got on my feet and I made it across Union Avenue, which is about a fourth of a block from Baloney Joe's, just past the service station across the street. And I went down on that corner like a ton of brick. That wine hit my legs and they were like wet noodles. When no way I could stand up. I was headed for detox to ask for help. Telephone pole kept moving. I couldn't get a hold of it. So I just crawled on my hands and knees a city block.